Jean Fresnel once wrote, Anatomy is to physiology as geography is to history. It describes the theater of events. Welcome to the A&P Professor, a few minutes to focus on teaching human anatomy and physiology with host Kevin Patton. In this episode, I introduce the new Android app for this podcast, and I interview my good friend Paul Krieger about his use of art in teaching anatomy and physiology. In previous episodes of this podcast, I've mentioned that an easy way to keep up with all the new episodes as they come out and maybe go back and review, search through and review older episodes is to do so on an app, either a podcast app or a radio app. And many of you are comfortable doing that and have found that that is an easy way to stay up to date with this podcast. But there are many people who find it much easier to just use a dedicated app. And I now have one of those for you. Uh, Now, this one only works with Android devices. So if you or someone you know uses an Android device and would like to keep up with the AMP Professor, they can go to the Google Play Store and just search for the AMP Professor, and you'll find the app. It's a free download. Download it to your device, and then it'll always be there. And a little reminder will pop up when uh, a new episode is available. You can search through a previous episode for a particular topic and so on. And uh, there are also um, additional uh, files and things like that that will be added as we progress through more episodes of this podcast. So you actually get bonus material by using that app. There will be an app for uh, Amazon uh, Kindle devices and an app for Apple iOS devices. And those are being worked on right now. They will be available soon. But right now, you can go into the Google Play Store and get that Android app. And uh, if you do, uh, give me some feedback and let me know how you're liking it. Well, this is a big experiment for me. This is the very first episode where I'm doing an interview. And uh, so welcome to the first interview episode of the AMP Professor podcast. Uh, the whole process of doing a podcast has been a real learning curve for me. And I've heard from other podcasters that one of the hardest things to get right, especially when you're starting out, is doing a remote interview. And uh, that's especially true for those of us that don't have a very deep background in audio engineering. So I'll let you be the judge and see whether we pulled it off or not. Uh, one great thing about doing this experiment is I get to do it with my good friend Paul Krieger, who is a professor of biology up at Grand Rapids Community College. And I've known Paul for over 15 years. I first met him at the Human Anatomy and Physiology Society, uh, where we have a lot in common, both being A&P teachers and having taught other courses such as general bio and chemistry. Uh, But he's also a member of the Textbook and Academic Authors Association, which I'm also a member, so I've interacted with him in that context as well. Uh, Paul, by the way, um, helped me in my textbook develop that uh, uh, transparency overlay system called the Clear View of the Human Body, but he's much more well-known for his series of books with Morton Publishing, which are called the Visual Analogy Guides, and they cover fields like anatomy, physiology, and chemistry, and general biology. And uh, those are sold at college bookstores all over the United States and Canada. And I've used uh, one of them myself in one of my courses, and the students absolutely love it. So there is a link in the uh, show notes and the episode page, so you might want to check those out. Uh, Paul is a great teacher. I've actually sat in on a course that he taught for uh, HAPS Institute, uh, which is a continuing education program for A&P teachers. And uh, he's won several teaching awards and things like that. So without further ado, let's uh, go ahead and uh, get Paul on the line, and uh, we'll go from there. Hi, Paul. Um, thanks for joining us for my very first interview, uh, remote interview on my podcast. And we're going to both... Uh, 
make this an experiment and see how it goes. And of course, uh, all the listeners are in on that experiment as well. And um, I understand that you're uh, talking to us from your uh, your home office. Is that right? Yes, I am. I'm. Uh, I have a home office in my basement, and that's where I'm working right now. Okay, and uh, I guess that's where all those uh, great uh, uh, visual analogy guides that you work on, they're mostly created right where you're, you're at right now. Right, exactly. I do a lot of my um, authoring work uh, at home in my home office, and I also do a lot of things in illustration, so a lot of that work takes place here. Okay, cool. Well, let's, let's get right to it. And speaking of illustration, um, you and I were communicating in anticipation of uh, meeting up with each other at the HAPS conference. And you mentioned that uh, you're starting to do this thing with your students called contour line drawing. And um, not being an art guy myself, I, I kind of have a rough idea of what that might be. But what what does that mean exactly? Contour line drawing, and what does that have to do with A and P? Good question. So contour line drawing is really an artistic technique. So it really is an, an art terminology, and what it really means is to draw the outline. So contour line is is really referring to drawing the outline of some structure. And for anatomy, we all know that. Understanding structures are, are is really essential for um, you know knowing key information. So this refers to getting the students to actually do the drawing themselves. So like in an art class where um, everyone might be drawing a um, a still life of of the same thing, the students are all working on drawing the same image. That's kind of what we're doing here is we're trying to get the students, like students in an art class, to draw the outlines of key organs, such as maybe a lung or a larynx or a microscopic structure, such as a villus. And by doing something like that, it really uh, helps them to really focus on shapes and relationships and things like that. So that's what contour line drawing really refers to. So the students are actually doing the drawing themselves. Okay, that sounds cool. Uh, So, you know, you describe this as sort of like in an art class where they're doing a still life. So Mm -hmm. do you have, you know, I, I can imagine in an art class there would be you know, an apple and an orange or whatever sitting on a table right. and everybody's gathered around and, and drawing that. Do you have uh, some kind of model or organ there or uh, how do you get the students uh, drawing? Okay, so uh, to give you an example, one of the first times I tried this recently, and I'm still at the experimental stages of using this myself, is that I tried it for a respiratory anatomy lab. So the way that it worked was I kind of thought about how I was going to do it. One possibility is I could have went right to the marker board and uh, have the students all have a blank sheet of paper in front of them. And I could have went to the marker board and and kind of uh, drawn the outline of a key structure, uh, such as a lung, and had them copy me as I'm doing that. That's one option. But what I did was instead was a variation on that. And I actually, I did the drawing in a PowerPoint where it was, I was showing line by line how to draw the shapes of key things. And so I just kind of did it step by step. So I created the drawing in a PowerPoint. So first I might start with a left lung, then a right lung, Um, and work my way through key structures for respiratory anatomy. So I had a PowerPoint, if you can imagine, imagine you're a student in the lab, you're looking at the screen, and um, I'm walking around the room controlling the, the PowerPoint slide remotely. So I'm using a remote control to go through, and the students are seeing the image on the screen while they're drawing it out. And I had them divide their uh, their sheet of paper into quadrants, and they could do, you know, key slides step by step. So that that's kind of how the process went, if you can visualize that happening in the lab. 
Yeah. Now you said that, uh, this is happening in the lab. So uh, this is an activity that you do in your in the lab part of your course. Yes, um, that's how I experimented with it. Again, it's just something new that I've been trying. And um, it, it seemed to go quite well, so I'm definitely going to do a little bit more of this. But it could be easily adapted to a lecture format or even an online class format. You could, if you did it in the PowerPoint way that I did, you know, you could do that in a lab setting. You could just as easily do it in a lecture setting. And um, you could even have that uh, you could do, for example, an instructor could maybe do a Camtasia video, have a recording showing the process. And if it was an online class, a student could be doing the drawing on a blank sheet of paper at their home, you know, for an online class. So I think it's very easily adaptable to the lecture, the lab, or to an online class. It certainly wouldn't have to be restricted to the lab. But the way that I did it was I really wanted them to focus on key structures before we went into our cadaver lab. And uh, we have a cadaver lab that has six cadavers. Uh, it has three plastinated specimens, whole body, and then it has three uh, wet specimens. And then in addition to that, we also have um, an organ bank. So I can haul out a bin that has an actual lung in it and show the students uh, a wet specimen of a lung. And um, so by doing the drawing first, it was kind of a nice preview to going into the cadaver lab. And I thought that um, for the way that, that I was running the lab, that worked out quite well. Yeah, it sounds like uh, you really can adapt it to all kinds of learning situations, which is great. So, you know, uh, mm -hmm. for our listeners, you know, pretty much <laughs> anything they're doing in their A&P class out there, they can probably find a way to try, um, you know, using this technique, um, you know, with their students. But one one thing before we get much further I, that I want to kind of come back to is the art part of it. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, art. You know, making art um, has been something that's been a little bit scary to me ever since third grade, when my third grade teacher uh -huh. looked at the hamburger I had painted that I thought was beautiful uh, and, <laughs> uh, and, re and realistic and everything. And uh, and actually remembering back to what my hamburger looked like, I, I think it was actually pretty good. But my, my third grade art teacher told me, never, ever go into art. You're horrible at it. <laughs> you know why? Oh, I'm sorry to hear you had that <laughs> negative experience. <laughs> well, you know, I think everybody's got a story like that with something. And uh, But, you know, I later went and did take some art classes. Um, but I always kind of shied away from the drawing part of it, uh, and probably for that reason. But uh, over time, you know, when you teach anatomy, uh, you can't hardly get away from <laughs> drawing. Mm -hmm. And so I've had right. to do it, you know, on the marker board. And, you know, when a student comes to my office and I, you know, kind of draw, sketch something out for them, whether it's a simple diagram sure. or it's an actual organ or whatever. And I found that the more mm -hmm. you do it, you know, if you just jump in and do it, it's not so bad. Um, mm -hmm. and so, uh, you know, for those, you know, anatomy and physiology instructors out there that maybe, uh, you know, this sounds to me like it's very doable. Um, you sent me the PowerPoint, um, presentation for the, the, uh, lung and other respiratory parts. Uh, you sent that to me and I, I went through it and I thought, oh my gosh, I want to do this <laughs> because it, I, you know, I don't mm -hmm. know if, if Paul's description was very clear, but it, mm -hmm. Uh, he, he'll make just like one line along the side of the lung. And then the next step is another line somewhere else. And so at first, I didn't know what he was drawing and until it started right. to take shape. And I think if students mm -hmm. do it that way, uh, rather than starting with the idea like, oh, my gosh, I have to draw this whole lung, if they just really focus mm -hmm. on that one line and then the next line, right. you know, and then the next line. Right. And um, mm -hmm. so how do your students – how do they react? I mean, do they feel, I mean, do you, you sense any um, apprehension or uncertainness or whatever when you say, okay, we're going to do drawing today? Right. So, um, 
Yeah, I was interested. I was keenly aware of what you mentioned. You know, there's always going to be some students who are art phobic or who had a bad experience with art or who are very uh, tensed up just about the idea of drawing. So I was keenly aware that not everyone's going to like this activity. But then it's almost like anything that you choose. If you choose a writing activity in class, there are students who love writing and hate writing. So you know, anytime you're dealing with a large group of students, you're always going to have some students that like it, some students that don't. So I was interested in observing how they were going to receive this. And what I noticed is, is that um, most of them liked it. So the majority of students liked the activity because I did explain to them the utility of it ahead of time. I said, by doing your own drawing, you're focusing on key structures and the sizes of things and the shapes of things. And you're really, rather than just passively looking at an image, you're making, um, making it your own and you're understanding it better. And you're also understanding, you know, key structures the way they really look better. And so after I showed them the utility of it, they, they at least, even those who were reluctant to draw, gave it their best shot. And one thing that I noticed, and this actually may be a benefit of doing the PowerPoint, is I was standing at the back of the room, and I was remotely controlling the PowerPoint. And I noticed that they were very riveted on the screen. Their focus and their attention was very sharp, much more so than passively looking at a generic PowerPoint presentation, because they were engaged in what was happening on the screen because they had to use their own hand-eye coordination to, to um, replicate what was happening with that lung and the drawing of the lines to represent uh, the fissures within each lung and to focus on really what was happening there and to translate it onto the page. So I was really impressed by how keenly they paid attention and um, there were a few students at the end of that activity of respiratory anatomy that said, oh, I'm glad it's over. And then I kind of just laughed with them and said, but you saw the purpose of us doing that, right? And they said, yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> um, so there were a few of those, but I'm happy to report that the vast majority of them, I was looking at their final product as I'm walking around the room. And most of them did a very good job replicating the key shapes and structures. And um, it was a useful study tool for them later. So overall, it went quite well. Well, you said that, um, you know, it was a useful study tool for them later. Uh, what what use do they make of this one? I mean, I, I can see clearly that the process itself of making the the drawing itself is a great, right. um, you know, uh, learning moment, uh, a great activity. Mm -hmm. And if that were the end of it, uh, that would be wonderful. But it sounds like it's not the end of it for at least some of your students. What, what do they do with it once they walk out? So I should mention one other thing is that in addition to having them doing the drawing, I also had them do labeling activities. So um, I did this in a in a very intentional way to to have them only do the drawing to start with. So I'm having them do the drawing line by line, step by step, and they're they're doing all the key structures, and then they will complete it. Then when I got to the end of doing that drawing, then I would point with a laser pointer on the screen, and I would have them draw a label like a leader line from a structure, and then have them write the name of the structure in their own handwriting which research says is always a better way to learn it, to write some a structure out in your own handwriting, just like making flashcards the old-fashioned way, writing it out yourself. So I had them all do that at the end. So they could easily use that as a study tool when they walk out of class. They could cover up the, cover up the names of the structures and then quiz themselves on the structures, um, just like you would do in – in an online assessment or maybe in a workbook or some activity book, very similar to that. So um, that's, that's how they can use them outside of class. Okay. That sounds pretty cool. I want, have you ever had any of the students come back with, uh, 
you know, uh, additional drawings or maybe additions to the drawings they made in class? Or I guess it's still kind of early in your uh, experiment. Yeah, it is early, too early for me to really have an assessment of that. I think later on, if I do more of this in lecture and lab, probably what I'll do is I might follow it up with an online survey, uh, sur such as SurveyMonkey, something like that, where I could get some feedback from the students on it. And, um, and it is kind of too early for me to say, would that actually change students study habits to the point where they might do some of their own drawings outside of class. I think there's certainly the potential for that. Um, but I wouldn't, I haven't collected any, any data regarding that at all. So, so we'll, that's kind of yet to be seen. Well, it seems like as we were talking about a little bit earlier, uh, it seems like there's just all kinds of different things that uh, a particular A and P teacher could do to adapt it to the way they're already doing their course, and could include some of those post drawing activities and so on. And um, boy, oh, oh you know, sure, you know, it seems like the sky's the limit with this thing. This is this is a great idea in. Uh, I'm definitely going to be checking back in with you to see, you know, how it's going in the long term and, you know, what other mm -hmm. tweaks you've made to this process, what you've added, taken away and so on. And um, if any of the listeners out there uh, have any questions uh, for Paul or, um, you know, any questions you want me to ask when I check back in with him later on, uh, just go to our episode page at the APProfessor.org and, uh, and contact us through um, the uh, telephone line or through the um, uh, email address. And uh, also at the episode page and in the show notes, depending on what app you're using to uh, listen to this podcast, I'll have a, a link to um, an example PowerPoint file uh, with some of the respiratory structures so you can really see exactly what Paul's doing um, using that PowerPoint technique to get his students drawing. And um, Paul, I sure do thank you for taking time out of your busy day to talk with us about this. And uh, I'm looking forward to seeing you at the uh, HAPS conference coming up soon. Oh, it was my pleasure, Kevin. Uh, no problem at all. I'm happy to do it. And I'll certainly be looking forward to seeing you at the conference as well. You may have noticed that I've been trying to get a new episode out every week. And uh, now that we're in the summer part of the academic schedule, I'm going to move to a goal of getting one out every two weeks. So we're moving from a roughly weekly schedule to a more or less bi-weekly schedule. So if uh, you're looking for the new episode to drop next week and get concerned about that, don't worry, everything's okay. That was planned. Uh, we'll be doing a new episode uh, approximately twice a month until we get back into the swing of things next fall. The a and Professor is hosted by Kevin Patton, professor, blogger, and textbook author in human anatomy and physiology. Minor imperfections enhance the handcrafted uniqueness of this podcast.